Now, um, I'd like to pass off this presentation to Andrew Russell, our program director extraordinaire, who will be moderating the panel discussion. And then we'll have time for question and answer at the end. So, Andrew. Thanks, Shannon. Hello, everyone. Um, it's great to know that there's so many longtime supporters here and allies, and some, we know there's some new folks here as well. So, welcome. I'm Andrew Russell. I'm the program director here at Resources. I'm just going to say a few words before we kind of jump into our presentations. Now, I know that Tuesday's elections are probably still on everyone's mind. We have some close races uh, still to be decided locally and regionally. Um, and of course, the importance of electing informed leaders who are proactively addressing all these big changes in our region uh, that need to happen. It can't be underestimated, but Resources has been around for 40 years and we've been making forward movement locally and regionally through the ups and downs, local elections, state elections, federal elections. Um, and we're gonna keep doing that. Uh, and every year we're making gains, we're building momentum, we're having wins. For example, last year, Resources and our ally organizations celebrated a huge victory. Uh, after nearly a decade in the making, we were able to put a check on fossil fuel expansions at Cherry Point. And this year, no different. Uh, we've had a lot of wins across an important range of critical issues. And, uh, you know, a lot of those wins were, um, you know, due to you all taking action uh, in response to our emails and our texts. So all that action, it's working. Um, we're working to end the cycle of fossil fuel investment in, in our buildings and ramp up the use of renewables to protect community health and ecosystems from forever chemicals. And we are taking critical steps towards a paradigm shift in how we approach forestry in our region, away from over harvesting and watershed degradation and towards forest recovery and climate resilience. And one of these things, one of the things um, that all of the winds are going to be hearing about today have in common is that they're laying the foundation for building towards positive change in our community with multiple benefits for people, for ecosystems, and for the climate. There's challenges, they're big, right? Resources, you know, we believe that these overarching stressors of climate change, population growth, um, you know, they have to be addressed and they must be used as opportunities to act now uh, to inspire and mobilize our communities like you all and to leverage decision makers to act on a wider scale. When we're thinking about what actions to take, we're really looking at this kind of nexus point of opportunity and impact. What's presenting it itself to us? How can we plug in? And in what ways um, can that you know, build momentum towards greater impacts and change? So today, you're gonna hear from three of our staff that I am just so honored I get to work uh, directly with. And each of them is leading on an area of work. They're gonna to talk to you about their win, about how it happened, why it's important and what's coming up next. And then we'll have some time after the presentations for some questions and we'll finish right at one. Um, so, uh, you know, it's back, eat your lunch and take a listen to these wins. So uh, for questions, we're gonna be using the Q and A feature in Zoom. If you're not familiar with us, you can just kind of go down to the bottom of your Zoom screen and kind of hover down there. And I think it's far at the right, you should see a Q&A box. So as you're listening to the presentations, you know, if questions pop up, feel free to just put them in there. Um, it's a little bit easier to use that feature than the chat feature. So please try to use that Q&A box and that way we can gather all the questions together and get to many, as many of them as we can. So I want you to hear about the work. So I'll wrap up by just saying a few words about each of our presenters. So today you're gonna to hear from Kirsten McDade, who's our pollution prevention specialist. Kirsten brings a solid scientific foundation, a passion for storytelling, and just a love of protecting water and people. Alexander Harris is our land and water policy manager. He's a new staffer um, who really hit the ground running and has brought just so much energy and experience around the role of forests uh, in watershed health and climate health. And then Anya Semenko, our digital engagement manager and the campaign lead for our 100% Northwest campaign. Anya has a great way of making change into a celebration um, and reminding us all what's possible. So without further ado, I will pass it along to Kirsten McBig. Hi, everyone. Um, 
Thanks uh, so much, Andrew, for that introduction. And again, my name is Kirsten, and I am the Pollution Prevention Specialist here at Resources, and which means I'm responsible for monitoring our local waterways and watchdog watchdogging water quality permits. So today, I'm really going to be talking to you about how we successfully managed to halt the biosolids plan at Post Point Wastewater Treatment Plant. Sometime in the early 2019, um, I basically began receiving phone calls and emails from community members telling me about this plan to build anaerobic digesters at the Fairhaven Post Point Wastewater Treatment Plant. And I really didn't know what these people were talking about, <laughs> but their concerns seemed legitimate. So I decided to investigate it. And what I learned was that in Bellingham, wastewater doesn't just come from houses, but it also comes from businesses and hospitals, industrial facilities and stormwater drains. Uh, and this means that there's a lot more than just human waste and water that goes to our sewage system. There are detergents, there's pharmaceuticals, petroleum products, and lots of other chemicals of concern. At the plant, the liquids are removed, they're treated and pumped out to Bellingham Bay, and this is called effluent. These facilities were updated recently and the Clean Water Act, happy birthday, happy 50th birthday Clean Water Act, uh, means that our wastewater effluent is regulated and is much cleaner today and will be getting even cleaner with a new nutrient permit that it's being issued. But what that also means that the solids that are left behind are becoming more and more concentrated than ever with contaminants. Currently, the solids at Post Point are being burned in an incinerator, which are on their last legs and need of replacing. Not to mention that these incinerators consume a lot of energy and emit greenhouse gases. So how do we treat these toxic sewage sludge? Well, the original plan that hatched in 2012 was to replace the incinerators with these anaerobic digesters. The sewage sludge would be put into this warm, oxygen-deprived environment where bacteria digest the organic material in the solids, much like composting. However, the bacteria can't digest most of these chemicals of concern, many of which are considered forever chemicals because they are so hard to destroy. Things like PFAS, PCBs, microplastics, fire retardants, you need a more extreme environment to break them down. So I also learned that when the sewage is applied to land, the contaminants in the sludge, they don't stay put. <laughs> They're suspended by wind, run off with rain, migrate down the soil column, and also can be taken up by plants and animals, which then incorporates them into the food web. These contaminants can then end up in our lungs, our drinking water, our food, and many of them are known to have adverse health effects, things like cancer, immune suppression, and endocrine disruption. Forever chemicals, uh, they just don't disappear. They get transported from one place to another, from one organism to another, and can accumulate over time. So even very small quantities of these chemicals can be harmful. And this is why it became so important that Bellingham's treatment plant not make and spread these contaminated solids. This seemed like a golden opportunity to stop these contaminants from re-entering into the environment. So how did we successfully fight this plan? Well, I mentioned that resources learned about this proposal from a few community members. This wasn't something that made it into our 2019 pollution program plan. This literally fell into our laps. Um, and this, the community then, um, the community support we received was the foundation, the bedrock of this fight and the continued support we got was critical. So people emailed city council daily, they used the city of Bellingham Engage website, and they also just reminded me that they weren't alone in thinking this is a really terrible bad idea, which helped to, to motivate us and keep the fight going. Another key component to the success was our continued pressure on the community leaders. Um, we sent in technical letters, emails, we had meetings, and we also had a field trip to the Edmonds Wastewater Treatment Plant to look at their new facility being constructed. We also launched an education and outreach campaign. All of the research that we were doing, well, we passed that on to the community through presentations, a website, flyers, tabling events, doorbelling, and lots of conversation and interviews with reporters, which resulted in a few articles being published in local newspapers. 
And when I say we, I truly do mean we, because Resources has a stellar communications team and our community members really stepped up to make all of this possible. So a question that we got frequently from the community is, well, what is the solution then to our solids management? So we had um, another piece of this project was to look into these emerging technologies. What are other wastewater treatment plants doing? Um, ones in our own backyard and ones around the world. I mentioned earlier that we drove down to Edmonds to look at their wastewater treatment plant. I went down with the public works director, two city council members, and a few community members to see a new gasification unit being built. We see this as a possible technology to be used up here in Bellingham. So while we're building our case for this site, regulations were also coming down the pipeline and costs were increasing. My guess is most of you have heard about PFAS per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. There's over 12,000 different kinds of them and they are ubiquitous in our environment. But it's also becoming apparent that even very small quantities, parts per trillion, that's one drop in an Olympic sized swimming pool, can have adverse health effects. Both Washington State and the EPA are addressing PFAS contamination and there will likely be regulations set in place that could affect the legality of sewage sludge spreading, like there are in other states such as Maine. In addition, there's a new nutrient permit that requires wastewater treatment plants to reduce their nitrogen outputs. And apparently anaerobic digesters contribute more nitrogen to wastewater, which makes removal more costly. It was estimated that if we went with anaerobic digestion, this would increase the nitrogen removal price tag by $200 million. So in addition to supply chain issues and inflation, the price tag ballooned from the original quote of $200 million to $1 billion. And then lastly, the glue that held this whole campaign together, the keystone of this stone arch, were my colleagues at Resources and our organization as a whole. We were able to pivot and rally behind this cause, which makes Resources unique that way. We also had a dedicated core group of community members that kept the fire burning. They were Rick Eggerth, Judith Akins, and Darlene Shanfeld with the Sierra Club. And we had Janet McGaughy and Brooks Andersons, two passionate and tenacious community members. We referred to ourselves as a citizens group and likely wouldn't have been as successful without this teamwork. And then so the reason I chose this analogy of building a stone arch is I was actually just up at Science World in Vancouver with my family a little while ago and they have this area where you can build this life-size arch with these big huge foam blocks and one of the key aspects of building an arch is that you can't build it by yourself so you need this strong solid base our community members we needed two teams to build each of the sides which was the pressure on our community letter leaders education outreach our technology regulations and costs and then lastly, we needed another team. In this case, it was resources in the citizens group put, to put that keystone in place. So it was a truly a collaborative process. And without any one of these pieces, the arch could not have been built. And the other key aspect to these stone arches is that, as, is that once they are built, they are very strong and resilient. They are stone, there are stone arches that are nearly 2000 years old that are still standing today. So all of this work, the building of community support, this monumental stone arch culminated on September 26 when nearly 400 of you contacted city council to tell them to vote against anaerobic digestion. And this was on top of all the other emails and all the other phone calls that occurred over the last two years. This was the final push. And it worked. The city council voted unanimously to halt anaerobic digestion and to pursue a more sustainable alternative. And in their deliberation, they referenced the outpouring of community input and how this was a major factor in their decision. So the community spoke and the city listened. So we do still have some work to do. We want the polluting incinerators replaced as soon as possible with technology that is protective of both human health and the environment. And we are actively working on this. And we're looking beyond the boundaries of Bellingham into building a regional facility in the county that would treat a variety of solid wastes and can be used as a demonstration project to research the best uses of the end products of thermal treatment, such as syngas and biochar, and how this interweaves with climate resilience and food security. There are still several wastewater treatment plants in Whatcom and Skagit County that are making and spreading biosolids. 
Lastly, we'll also look for opportunities to share our local experiences with other communities and act as a model for Washington State and beyond. We have already been in communication with other communities who are fighting a similar fight. So again, thank you all for joining us and for your support for listening today. And now it's time for uh, my colleague, and as Andrew mentioned, our newish land and water policy manager, Alexander Harris, to talk about some of the impressive work that he's been doing in our local forests and watersheds. Thanks, Kirsten. That was a lot for 10 minutes. I will also be speaking for 10 minutes. Hopefully I can be as eloquent and succinct. Uh, my name is Alexander Harris. I'm the Land and Water Policy Manager at Resources, and I'm going to be telling you more about Resources' newest uh, campaign, which is going to be launched on Monday, known as Future Forests. Before I get into that, I can introduce more about myself. I'm originally from Southern Oregon, and now I live in the South Fork Valley, about 30 minutes east of Bellingham. I have a background in community organizing uh, and forest and climate policy work, mostly in Oregon, uh, but I've been up here for about four years and learned a lot about Whatcom County and, and, and Washington. I also have a background in uh, environmental policy. I finished a graduate um, program at Western Washington University about six months ago. I focused my research on community forestry and the opportunity to actively manage forests for climate resilience and watershed health. So you'll be hearing some of those themes in my presentation. I wanted to give you a little overview of the Bessie timber sale. Many of you have probably heard of Bessie. Uh, and I wanted to kind of give a primer on, on what this uh, timber sale was all about and the role that resources played in protecting a, a key legacy forest in the Lake Whatcom watershed. So starting with a little bit of background, uh, as you can see in this map, there's two units in, in the Bessie timber sale. Unit one is 120 acres in pink, and that was mostly uh, plantation land that had been logged at least twice before. The other unit was, uh, it's there, unit two highlighted in yellow, and it is 46 acres of legacy forest. And when I say legacy forest, um, I'm describing naturally regenerated, uh, unplanted forests. These are native forests that were probably logged uh, within the last 75 to 150 years. And the standards back then uh, for, for logging didn't require replanting, which allowed these forests to naturally regenerate. And it's contributed to structural diversity, biodiversity that you don't really find in planted forests known as plantations. So this legacy forest was, was uh, by itself unique, but it also happened to be within the Lake Whatcom watershed. So you can notice on this map on the far right, uh, that's the southern end of Lake Whatcom. And the road that kind of goes along this map is Park Road. I'm not sure if you know where that is, but think of like the very end of, of Lake Whatcom. That's kind of uh, where the Bessie timber sale was located. So uh, about a year, year and a half ago, um, this was before I worked with resources, uh, I began uh, working with a bunch of other community groups on uh, you know, really learning more about this timber sale and trying to learn, uh, is this something that our community should be concerned about? Is this something that we should oppose? And an ad hoc coalition of community groups was formed in response to this timber sale. And essentially our goal was to go out into the forest, measure trees, conduct different types of geospatial analysis. That's GIS work, mapping work, where you get to see the different characteristics of the project. And then we did, uh, we engaged in the technical comment process. And Resources was involved in this. Many other groups uh, locally were involved in submitting uh, technical comments for uh, different parts of the regulatory process. Resources and other groups also spread the word through email, e-blasts, letters to the editor, and social media. The goal was to get the word out so that there would be a more robust community dialogue around how this public state-owned forest land was managed within Bellingham's watershed. 
There was also organizing to get Whatcom County Council to weigh in. Of course, the county council does not have direct jurisdiction over state lands. However, uh, DNR is oftentimes some, pretty responsive to what the local community wants. And uh, as there was more and more community interest and community pushback in this timber sale, uh, the county council decided to send a letter to DNR and the Board of Natural Resources uh, to basically say, hey, we want to pause this timber sale and look closer at this legacy forest parcel to see if maybe it should be protected. Over the course of uh, resources to email alerts, there were over a thousand people who commented on one part of the uh, technical review process in, in the regulatory process. That was significant. Uh, usually in forestry issues uh, locally, there, there is some interest, but there's usually not that much interest. So this goes to show, uh, I think a few things. One, that the community of Bellingham and the surrounding area really cares about their drinking water. Drinking water is uh, increasingly important and imperiled by development and sprawl, by aggressive logging practices, and of course, by climate change. So I think this shows that there was concern for the watershed. The other thing I think this shows is that there's an increasing awareness of the importance that forests play in mitigating climate impacts. We're starting to see into the future of what types of climate impacts are projected. Uh, in particular, the climate impacts to hydrology. Uh, we're seeing more water flowing through our systems in the winter and less and less water flowing in the summer. And that kind of uh, extreme is only gonna become more pronounced uh, with climate change. There's a growing awareness that uh, ecological forest management can play a role in mitigating uh, those hydrologic impacts of climate change. So because of this community uh, input and this community response, uh, DNR did something that they had never done before. They announced a first ever carbon project where they decided to take just a chunk of this timber sale and remove it from the timber base and instead generate uh, money as a carbon reserve that is actually um, set aside for conservation and uh, the, the carbon that is stored in that forest is monetized on the market and money is actually able to be generated for the trust beneficiaries that depend on DNR, uh, DNR revenue. This was phase one of the project, and there were about 1,400 acres throughout Whatcom County that were protected. Uh, so Bessie Unit 2 was within that. There were other acres in the Lake Whatcom watershed and also some acreage in the South Fork watershed near where I live. Uh, this was very significant because other counties got a few hundred maybe or none at all. This goes to show that DNR was very uh, cognizant of how important forests are to Whatcom County folks. And they recognized that by leveraging this, this alternative revenue source. There is a phase two that is in the works. And soon in the next few weeks, you'll be uh, getting an email from us about uh, what opportunities exist for using this model to protect other key forests that are not as suitable for commercial harvest. So on Monday, we are releasing a new uh, forest campaign and then we're calling it Future Forests. The goal is to advance ecological forestry throughout the Mount Baker foothills. And uh, before I get into these bullet points, I just wanted to flag uh, sometimes people hear the words ecological forestry and they think, oh, that, that just means you're locking up more forest. And I, I want to just make sure it's clear that ecological forestry is a very hands-on approach to forest management, where foresters are innovatively designing timber sales to mitigate certain ecological impacts of commercial logging. However, commercial timber supply continues to come off of these stands and uh, it's, it's a very labor intensive approach that I think is very important for the timber industry going forward. So the components of our program, of our, of our campaign will be to educate and mobilize citizens and communities in the area to support ecological forestry, 
to promote restorative thinning on public lands within the Lake Walker watershed. So there's city, county, state land all within the Lake Walker watershed. And there's opportunities to support certain types of uh, thinning and certain types of logging that actually improve forest health and watershed health in the in the watershed. Another component of our of our goal of our uh, campaign will be to watchdog timber sales in uh, Whatcom County and the surrounding area to make sure that certain legacy forests that are of certain uh, ecological importance are protected from harvest, and then also to encourage community forestry as a tool to balance. Uh, economic, cultural, and economic, I'm sorry, ecological, economic, and cultural goals. I wanted to close with uh, a video that I've spent the last few months working on. Uh, this was a video featuring Jerry Franklin, who is a preeminent forest ecologist. He's been doing uh, research on the Douglas fir uh, region for 70 years. Uh, and he, he's now retired and he's very, uh, very adamant of getting the word out about ecological forestry and the role it can play. So with that, I will turn it over to Jerry to uh, tell us more about ecological forestry. This is not a forest, it's a plantation. And plantations were designed with a goal in mind of producing wood. And we're cutting Douglas fir off at the ankle? What in the hell are you doing? The question is, how do you want them managed? So I've spent my whole life now working with Douglas fir and the ecosystems of which it's a part. Hello, butterfly. <laughs> you open it up, but you don't remove the entire stand. Collaborating with force to be of mutual benefit to both that force system and to our society. That's called ecological forest management. Big epicorbic branch systems, holy smoke. <laughs> so this video comes out on Monday and uh, I'm very excited to share this. We'll have a bunch of kind of shorter bite-sized pieces available on social media. And I really encourage you to watch the video and, and to share it to get the word out. With that, I will turn it over to Anya, who will be telling us more about her work on 100% Northwest. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, I hope you all enjoyed that film. Every time I watch it, I just feel uh, incredibly excited about what's to come. Um, so uh, my name is Anya Semenko. I am the Digital Engagement Manager at Resources. If you've seen social media, emails, uh, blog posts, some of those things, that's that's where I'm hanging out in the work. Um, but I am also the campaign lead on 100% Northwest, which is our clean energy campaign, um, ostensibly for the next eight years. We'll get into that. Um, I am originally from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, um, so I am no stranger to the intersection of pollution, clean water climate change, fossil fuel industry. Um, so so that, is, that is heavily in my background. And then I also have a master's degree in environmental journalism from the University of Colorado Boulder. So you can see I've just slowly been making my way uh, further west across the country um, and landed about as far as I can get in Bellingham. Um, but let's dive into 100% Northwest. So I'm gonna start us off with a little bit of urgency. Um, we have to stop burning things. That might not be news to you. Um, in August 2021, the IPCC released a new report, which many called the Code Red for Humanity, pretty dire. Um, basically, the report said that uh, we have to sound the death knell for coal and fossil fuels um, before they destroy our planet. And that countries need to end all fossil fuel exploration and production and shift entirely onto renewable energy. Um, and then if that wasn't dire enough in February 2022, so earlier this year, um, they released another report with even more urgency saying that basically at the absolute worst, we have to stop adding emissions to the atmosphere by 2050. 
And while this might seem like an incredibly short timeline, the reality is we've we've had this data, we've known the outcomes of inaction for decades. Um, the transition to 100% clean energy would be much easier if we'd started 50 years ago. Um, so now we have to do all of this work in the next few decades to ensure a livable future. Um, that urgency and also the collective hope uh, of coming to solutions is where our new campaign 100% Northwest was born. And the good news is Northwest Washington has already made um, some big commitments that get us very, very close to our goals. Uh, the city of Bellingham is committed to 100% renewable energy by 2030. Um, and through the Clean Energy Transformation Act, also known as CETA, uh, Washington utilities must eliminate coal power by 2025, become carbon neutral by 2030, and phase out gas-fired power generation from our electric grid entirely by 2045. So those numbers are actually getting us very, very close close to the goals that the IPCC set for us. Um, and it's our work at resources to ensure that these goals then get met. So you can set the goal, but then you have to make sure that that goal is actually getting closer to achievement. Um, and as UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said this week from COP27, humanity has a choice, cooperate or perish. Um, and so we're kind of working under that, that time frame there. So why 100% Northwest? Um, 100% Northwest is a campaign meant to harness the urgency of this moment. Uh, we have one simple goal, transition Northwest Washington to 100% clean energy economy by 2030. So no big deal, right? Just eight years to make that happen. Um, and that timeline might look really short, uh, but we also know it's 100% possible to move to a clean energy economy. Um, for example, globally, 62% of total renewable power generation added last year had lower costs than even the cheapest fossil fuel options. And the emissions associated with energy use are on track to increase by only 1% this year because of such a big boon in wind and solar power. Um, and those are just a couple of the dozens of reasons for hope. Um, I wanted to throw as many as I could in here, but we got to move through this. Um, all the pieces are really in place for us to transition fully off of fossil fuels. Um, and so the purpose of 100% Northwest is to find and implement these systemic solutions, so, you know, moving beyond the individual, digging into those big sweeping policy solutions, um, as well as building power within our community, hence some of the base building tactics you may have seen from us this year, um, and then discovering new levers of power that we can access. So how do we win under this campaign? Um, basically, we have to do a little bit of everything all at once. So we're taking a three-pronged approach to this work. Uh, first up, you'll see we've got building clean energy. Um, while we might have 100% renewable energy available, uh, while, we, while we might not have 100% renewable energy available just yet when you plug your outlets into your house or you know, around town, um, we need to start transitioning everything we can to be electric so that when we have 100% clean energy, we're not wasting any time continuing to burn fossil fuels and things like stoves and heaters, cars, other appliances, things like that. Um, second up is financing clean energy. Uh, there will certainly be a cost to transitioning to 100% clean energy economy, we know that, um, but we also know from multiple reports that the cost of an action will most certainly be higher. So regardless, we need to make sure that funds are allocated um, at the regional and individual levels to ensure the greatest equity when moving this work forward. And finally, we need to power clean energy. Um, we need to ensure that when you do plug in, that there is abundant clean energy available and that it dominates the market in production. Um, so you know you're always getting the cleanest energy possible. Um, so what does that look like uh, in actual energy trends? Um, you can see from the tan line on this graph on the left uh, that electricity generation from natural gas is steadily declining and predicted to continue declining, while renewables, uh, which are the green line, um, are steadily on the rise and predicted to continue rising. Um, similarly, if you look at the graph on the right, you'll see that uh, the cost of constructing solar projects is de decreasing drastically. Um, and we're adding capacity year over year while looking at something like natural gas construction, um, it's growing ever more expensive um, and companies are opting to decrease capacity and, and, and pull that production offline. Um, and, and so all of that to say that the transition to a clean energy economy is already on us um, and the writing is on the wall. We're moving to clean energy one way or another. Um, so 
the nor Northwest Washington kind of has this chance right now to be a leader in this work. So how does Washington stack up? Um, you might already know this, Washington has some of the cleanest electricity in the country, and that's mostly thanks to hydropower, um, which I know can be a little bit of a contested issue, and we're not going to dive into that today. But what you can see from this chart is that we have lots of room for growth in non-hydro renewables, as well as bringing that natural gas and coal-fired generation power down. Um, it's also worth noting here just how much electricity consumption comes from the residential sector. Um, it's more than a quarter. Uh, we saw that reducing residential fossil fuel use as one of the most efficient ways to curb emissions quickly and at scale. Um, so cutting down that portion of the emissions pie will have huge impacts for a region, which is why I wanted to dive into a few of our important wins this year. So we kicked off 2022 with a pretty impressive win passing a Bellingham electrification ordinance for new commercial and multifamily residential buildings, um, which basically means new buildings can no longer be built with natural gas, uh, which not only immediately reduces our emissions, uh, but also sets us on the path to be ready as we quickly transition to a clean energy economy. Um, and nationwide, the use of gas for electricity and heating now contributes to climate pollution more than coal. Um, and in Washington state, homes and buildings are the single fastest growing source of climate pollution. Uh, and that's up 50% from 1990. Um, and now causes, like I said before, a quarter of Washington's climate pollution, um, which is more than the industrial sector. So, so this win is especially important here in Bellingham. Um, and there's lots of other reasons for getting gas out of homes, um, especially around health. Burning gas in your home is really terrible for your respiratory system and nervous system. Um, but staying in line with our goal of 100% clean energy by 2030, this important ordinance gets us that much closer to that. Um, and I'm excited to tell you that just last week, we built really heavily on this win uh, with a statewide win around building electrification. So on Friday last week, resources and our coalition partners helped the Washington State Building Code Council pass new construction rules. Um, and that requires all new homes in Washington. So not just Bellingham, we're extending out to the whole state now, be built with efficient electric heat pumps and electric water heaters instead of polluting natural gas heaters. Um, for a little background, this was a nine to five vote that followed months of contentious public testimony. Um, in April, we managed a smaller win, which required new commercial construction to switch to heat pumps. Uh, but we've really locked in this victory by extending this requirement to all new home construction in the state. Uh, not only will this drastically reduce our carbon emissions, but it also sets us up as a national leader. Uh, these new building codes are the strongest heat pump codes in the nation and among some of the strongest strongest new building codes. So from my viewpoint, we're continuing this legacy of leadership and impressive community camaraderie right here in Northwest Washington, um, which is something we should all absolutely be celebrating. So to quickly give you an idea of the power that's behind this work and that went into this, we drove nearly 1,700 people to connect with their lawmakers this year on initiatives related to 100% Northwest, uh, pushing on those levers of powder, power, building a stronger base in our community for action. Um, and we really saw those numbers have an impact on our community. And then we also get engaged with the community uh, in several other kinds of actions this year um, that kind of just uh, shook up the way we think about working with one another. Um, we launched the Electrify Whatcom County Facebook group, um, added more than 80 members to it. This is a space, if you're not already in it, I highly recommend you go look it up on Facebook. It's a great group. Um, this is a space of collaboration and community support, uh, kind of gets folks out of some of that toxicity we can see on apps like Nextdoor um, and provides more of a, of a safe container for folks to ask questions about transitioning to 100% clean energy, raise concerns, ask questions about installing HVAC units, things like that, um, and just seek guidance from the community. So it, it's that way of um, building power among our community members. And then we also launched the 100% Northwest Pledge, um, which if you, uh, it was a postcard writing campaign, um, remi reminding folks that they made this commitment to um, helping us transition to 100% clean energy. And if any of y'all filled out those postcards, um, you should have received them in the mail pretty recently, just as a little nudge heading into the election season. Um, 
And then uh, as, as Andrew mentioned, I'm all about celebration and think that that's a really important part of our campaigns and our work. Um, we held several community celebrations around our wins, um, bringing together our supporters, the public, lawmakers, um, all together so that we could spend time with one another, um, which we found especially important after the isolation of the early portions of the pandemic. Um, by gathering together, we're working to demystify what it means to be an engaged citizen. We're reducing barriers for folks and increasing access to those levers of power, like our lawmakers and our community leaders. So it just, it takes down those barriers, it takes down those walls and it gets us all together in one place um, and kind of humanizes the movement a little more. So we worked pretty hard on that this year. And then, um, I'm sure you're super interested to know what's it going to look like in 2023 as we keep moving forward with this campaign over the years. Um, first up, we're digging into the Inflation Reduction Act uh, heavily in 2023. Um, in case you missed it, this act sets in motion $370 billion in federal funding, um, which should ultimately reduce greenhouse emissions in the, U in the U.S. Uh, 40% by 2030. Um, Current projections right now are showing that the average Whatcom County household should save about $267 a year on their energy bills from this bill. Once that program is fully implemented, um, we'll cut 116 metric tons of carbon emissions. Um, and we'll also create thousands of clean energy installation jobs that can't be automated, can't be offshored, um, and will really benefit our community. Um, and we're also seeing those savings uh, will be pretty huge for the 44,000 households in Whatcom County who are still using um, electric resistance, fuel oil, propane, um, as well as 46% of Whatcom County households who are considered low to moderate income. So that's really uh, what the IRA funding is centered on, making sure that qualified households um, receive assistance um, and that we can apply all of those tax credits that this bill provides. Um, other exciting projects coming up, um, we're digging into research and development for a community solar project. Uh, we're still in the very early stages of this portion of the campaign, um, but we cannot wait to update you as this project gets underway. There's, there's a lot of momentum behind it. Um, and then you'll also see us weighing in uh, very soon on state legislative advocacy. It's coming up in early 2023 um, as the legislative session kicks off. Uh, and there's going to be plenty of op other opportunities to gather and ensure your voices are heard um, by those in power. It's going to be an exciting year. Um, we're definitely going to need your support to lock in some more big wins. And so with that, um, we're about to head into the Q&A portion of the webinar. But as your digital engagement manager, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't tell you about some of the best ways to stay engaged with us. Um, first up, most likely you're already on our email list if you received the invite for this webinar. But just in case, make sure to, you're signed up for emails. And what you might not know is at the bottom of all of our emails that we send, there's a button that says update your preferences. Um, if you click that, you can make sure that you're opted into our action alerts as well as our volunteer emails. Um, opting into both of those just ensures you never miss an update from us. Um, we kind of segment these out so that we don't blow up your inboxes all the time. But if you want to receive everything we're putting out there, that is the best way to do it. Um, secondly, if you're not already signed up for our text, um, you can just text the word resources, all one word, um, to 40649. It'll opt you into our text message updates. Um, if you're like me and you get overwhelmed by email easily, I highly recommend this. It's a super easy way to stay engaged with us. Um, and we only we reserve texting for our most important actions and events, so you don't have to worry about us blowing up your phone. We promise to keep a light touch on that. Um, and then finally, I just got to give you a little plug. We're a few weeks away from Giving Tuesday um, and have been super fortunate to secure $40,000 of matching funds from a super generous donor, um, meaning any gifts donated specifically for Giving Tuesday will be doubled um, until we reach our goal. Uh, this is our single biggest day, fun, single day fundraiser of the year. Um, and it's one of the most exciting days for our staff as we all sit around and watch the donations come in, um, cheering and hollering as we get closer to our goal. So if you really want to make our day and just know that your donation is truly celebrated and appreciated by all of us at Resources, um, giving for Giving Tuesday is one of the best ways to do that. And with that, I will hand it off to Ander so that we can dive into some of your great questions. Right. Thank you, Anya. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you, Kirsten. Um, we have a few questions. And if you've got a question, go ahead and put it in the Q&A. Um, and we'll see if we can get to it. 
first question is about um, Bessie and about the DNR carbon project. So the question is, and maybe you could speak just beyond Bessie to Alexander, is the Bessie unit two carbon value based on carbon already stored by the trees or the additional carbon capture that will take place as they continue to grow? And is that well estimated? It's a really juicy question. Um, and I've asked that question many times. I recently got a response from DNR that was somewhat clear. Uh, both will be accounted for in the monetization of this carbon pilot project. So carbon offsets are kind of a strange thing. They're about looking at future behavior as it theoretically is likely to happen, and then trying to figure out if a carbon uh, project were to be implemented, how would that modify behavior in the future? What types of logging would not take place on a specific stand? And with that modification, how much extra carbon is remaining in the forest that would have been emitted to the atmosphere? So there's a lot of counterfactuals to determine what constitutes additionality. And if that sounds like a bunch of mumbo jumbo, it kind of is, a, it's, a, it's a made up world of how to pay for this invisible thing in the sky that none of us can see, but we know it's there, carbon dioxide. How do we monetize carbon? And this is a scheme that is constantly evolving. Um, something that is worth mentioning is that Washington now has its own cap and trade program that goes live in 2023. And they will have uh, their own approach to carbon offsets and leveraging forests for adaptation, uh, but also for carbon mitigation. So there are opportunities to strengthen the way we approach carbon and make sure, A, it actually makes a difference for climate change, but B, to make sure that it doesn't uh, totally destroy our timber industry. And I think those are two things that are, uh, in, 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 at least in my mind, uh, high priorities, but it's at times hard to reconcile, but I believe they are reconcilable. I truly do believe that. So Bessie is kind of a good first step. A lot of details yet to be figured out, uh, but I think it's a good first step to start asking some of these bigger questions. Awesome. Um... I'll get to this one. Um, so Anya, uh, what do you say to people who want uh, a generator to use when the power goes out? Yeah, this is a really important question. Um, so I'm really glad uh, this got asked. Um, so I think there's a there's a misnomer as we look at the transition to clean energy. I think a lot of people think we have to go all or none, um, like either we transition everything right now or we give up and let climate change take over. Um, and so the reality is right now, we don't have perfect systems in place if and when, um, we know this happens in Whatcom County, if and when the power goes out. And so what I would say to folks is, yes, if you are in a situation in which you have an emergency, you, um, you have oxygen that runs on electricity, some kind of health issue, you're worried about the heat and the cold, um, definitely, Look, if we need gas powered generators here and there to make the transition happen, um, yes, we're going to need them. The reality is in the next couple of years, though, we're going to see things like um, like microgrids, battery storage, um, other kinds of wind and solar um, on individual homes, um, increase in use, decrease in cost, increase in feasibility. Um, and so that transition will be able to happen more seamlessly in time. Um, but as we're, as we're leaping into that transition, if there need to be a few overlaps in which we have things like generators to protect ourselves from some of the worsened plaques we're going to see from climate change in regards to weather, um, that's okay. There, there's no shame in that. Um, and we're open to it being a, modular dynamic space um, in which we have to do that work. And I'll, hi, uh, I'm Simon, communications manager. I've been running slides and stuff, but I also worked on 100% Northwest campaign. And I'll just add to that, that uh, one of the most important parts of phasing out gas in our built environment is the gas infrastructure and the pipelines. Um, 
uh, like on-site things like generators and tanks and stuff isn't as big of an issue. But if we continue to build out gas infrastructure, new pipelines that leak methane constantly all the way from the, the fracking wells to the appliances they're used, the whole way they're leaking methane, um, building out that just for like smaller uses in case of emergencies is not the best option. There are other ways that we can deal with emergencies um, that might include small localized fossil fuel use, like Anya said, but um, continuing to build out this whole system just for those like small instances is is not the answer. Okay, I'm turning off my video now. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Simon. Hi, Simon. Um, Kirsten did a great job at mentioning the organizations that we are working with um, on the post point work. We've got a question asking, are what are the organizations or the other organizations in Whatcom County that are watchdogging forests? That's for you, Alexander. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, historically, there have been numerous. Uh, Conservation Northwest uh, was founded in Bellingham in the late 80s, but generally stays pretty high level on state level policy and federal policy. So they track federal forest management a lot closer than DNR forest management. Um, so locally, there aren't a lot of uh, nonprofit groups. Uh, one of our partner groups who has been tracking forest issues is called the Center for Responsible Forestry and their new organization. They're specifically looking at state lands. There's also uh, Wacom Land Trust. They don't watchdog any uh, you know timber sales or anything like that. But, they play a very important role in local uh, land use conversations regarding agriculture, development, and forestry. So they, they have a long history of doing great work here, and we will surely be working closely with them in the years ahead. Um, yeah, I don't think I'm forgetting any groups. Uh, that's that's probably, probably it. Awesome. We are getting close to time. Someone asked if we could post the link to the page on our website to sign up for action alerts. Um, we can do that. Also, if you are getting emails from us, um, as Anya mentioned, you know, in an email that you got from us, if you go down to the bottom um, and manage your preferences, you can opt in for action alerts. Um, but we can, you know, it basically, if you go to our website and say, take action, you know, <laughs> you'll, you'll find the link. Um, but we we can certainly post a link to the website. Um, there was a couple other questions, um, one about logging on Lummi Island and one about geothermal power. And um, we will capture your names and answer those questions um, at another time because we want you all to get on with the rest of your day. So I'm going to pass it on to Shannon to close us out. Great, and before I do that also, um, Alexander, my understanding too, is that Lummi Nation Nooksup tribe continue to play an important role, especially tracking some of the federal actions on, um, on our forests. So maybe follow up with the folks uh, that ask those questions as well, is that correct? Yeah, for sure. So tribes are consulted on federal and state forest practices. Yep. Great. All right, so um, thank you so much, Alexander, Kirsten, Anya, and Andrew, and everyone who joined today. And we do invite you, please do, if you have more questions or comments or wanna make connections, that's how this all works. So please just follow up with us individually. Um, our emails are on our website or just give us a call. And um, we really appreciate everyone's support. And it's great to see so many, so many faces here today and so many names. Uh, so thank you, have a great rest of, rest of your week.